What's up, football fans? We've only got a couple of weeks left of the fantasy football regular season, and it is do or die time in both the leagues. There's lots to discuss, lots of things happened. Next week for me in both leagues is bye week hell, so that'll be fun. But let's not dwell on that and focus on how we did this week first as we launch in with the Andy Dalton fan club first. This week in the Andy Dalton fan club, I had a treacherous matchup against Scott, who's averaged like 130 points plus for the last four or five weeks. Quite concerning. As well as that, we're in the same division because we're in two divisions in our league, which meant only one of us can get a bye. So this game was very much a must win for the best chance at making something of the season. And fortunately, Scott's team wasn't able to perform to their usual high standard. And my team really tried their heart out with the score being 148 to 111. But let's have a look at the numbers here. So... We went back to Sam Donald at quarterback without Baker Mayfield. And not really sure if we could trust Geno Smith. So that was the decision that we made. And it paid off. I mean, Jalen Hurts was playing on Thursday Night Football and only managed 23 points. Which I instantly was like, Sam Donald can beat that. I don't know if he will, but he can. Which was a lot scarier. Bearing in mind, Jalen Hurts has put up a number of 30 point plus weeks. Sam Donald went out. He got us the lead there. Both of our running back rooms probably underperformed based on expectations. You'd expect Taylor and Williams in this league especially to probably average about 16 to 20 points each per week. So I was looking at potentially a 40-point back, a forty point running back room here. And on the flip side, both of these guys do average 18, 19 points. So I was expecting this to be like 40 plays, 40, maybe one guy shines. But end up being 24 plays, 30-ish. Um, Bijan had a pretty poor week. Fortunately, J.K. Dobbins, with the two scores in the win over Cincinnati, was huge. Wide receiver room is where I think the big difference was made. Jamar Chase being in that in that late window game against Cincinnati did have me a little bit worried, not knowing what was going to happen there. Fortunately, Cooper Cup with two receptions against New England alleviated a lot of that stress, and Debo having a pretty poor game against Seattle allowed Justin Jefferson having his second worst week of the season both of which have been on my roster, by the way, um, to still result in my wide receiver room pretty severely outperforming his. First time this season, I think, I've won at the tight end position, in this league at least, um, with Hunter Henry racking up seven points compared to Hawkinson's 1.6. Then the flex position, Alvin Kamara has been a very scary sight all season. So him only imagine 13.5 points was actually a pretty big relief especially when Cook goes out there, gets two rushing touchdowns and not a whole lot else, man, just 17 points. Very grateful for that. Sanders with 11 points compared to Tucker's six is nice. And my defense didn't quite do as well as his, but the game was already well won by that point. Um, although Lonai's defense barely finishing above 15 points and they concede six points is hilarious. Ironically, though, I made mistakes. I should have played Higgins over Jefferson, which, let's be honest, I was never going to do, but that's what I should have done. And that would net me an extra 16 points. And the Steelers' defence would have got me an extra two points had I played them in their win over Baltimore, which is insane when you consider they conceded 16 points, then turnovers came home to roost. But could Scott have done anything to change his luck? Not really. He could have put Stevenson in for any of his three running backs, and that would have been more points, but it wouldn't have won him the game. Reed would have been a seven point upgrade over Debo again wouldn't have won in the game and that was it there was no other upgrades to be had for him it is what it is fortunately my guys balled out this week his guys didn't another week it could have gone another way but that does give me we're one on one against each other this season which gives me the um gets rid of the swing factor there um and it means I have a better record than him now so as long as I can win out I should lock up that bye week seed. Next up, Ryan versus Skip. Ryan, once again, on that losing streak. When he won that game with some of his players coming back to full fitness, I started to get a little bit worried that Ryan was going to play spoiler, but doesn't seem to have happened so far. Skip back to winning ways with 107. Let's have a look at the, the box score here. Jordan Love, 23. A-Chan, 21. Puka Nakua, 20. That was about it. That is 63 points there. He managed another 16 in total. 
Nine of them came from the Bills' defense. Hopkins cost him three points. Smith, three and a half. Andrews, two and a half. Wilson, 2.4. Just not a lot to write home about at all. 107 is not a particularly good score, but what happened here? CJ Stroud, 14 and a half points, isn't great. Josh Jacobs, 24, 24 25 points. Najee Harris, 14 points. Um, McLaurin only managed one point in the Thursday night football, which is a little bit of a shock when Jane Daniels has been finding ways to get Terry the ball a decent amount. Shakur only managed eight points, which is a little bit rough. Travis Kelsey, 1.1. Jamal Williams, 24 points in that blowout Detroit Lion win over Jacksonville. It's one of them games where if your person in that uh, in like the Lions team didn't score a lot of points, you feel incredibly unlucky. Especially when it was like five different people scored touchdowns. McManamus only managed two points, but that's still a five-point benefit over the Ryan's kicker. And then the Vikings defense, 17 points, is very impressive. Worthy starting would have got him an extra few points, an extra 12 points. Um, Williams and Curtis Samuel and Brown... There is enough points on this bench to win in the game. There is Bajor style. He had an extra 37 points worth of running backs. Which would have been real world 34. And then he could have had McConkian for Wilson for an extra 12. So, I mean, that's like 120 points. If only he hit, like, optimised lineup, he probably would have had a chance of winning that game. Next up, we have Pash versus Fraze. Fraze loses again on a two-game loss streak now. What happened? Saquon Barkley. That's, that's what happened. No one else did anything worth discussing for Pash other than Saquon Barkley. 146 rushing for two scores and 52 receiving. 40.6. Wow, wow, wow. I mean, Chuba Hubbard was on a bye week and started. If he'd have put... I mean, wouldn't have made a difference. Although, he could have had an extra five points at kicker. And an extra six points at flex. Yeah, it's only 11. Still wouldn't have made any difference. There was, there, this was an unwinnable, unwinnable game. When when one of your players scores 40 points, if you don't win, you're going to be pretty embarrassed anyway. Um, but when you've got five guys breaking 10 points, you do feel like you should be doing better than this. I can't help but feel. Charger's defense only mentions six points hurts. His kick one, not having a flex hurt. The tight end battle was lost pretty hard. Wide receivers didn't do much. Running backs did pretty well. But when Saquon outscores both of them by himself, it kind of becomes a moot point. Um, both of these guys are still very much in... Oh, Fraser actually isn't really anymore. Pash is very much in the playoff picture. And I'm sure he'll be hoping to try and win out his remaining games to lock into a playoff spot. Now, here comes the big sad of the week. I'm not doing this live, so James isn't here to watch me and break down what happened here. Anchor, with only her fifth win of the season... Now on a three-game winning streak, 196 points to beat James's 176. James would have beat everyone else in the league this week. In fact, he would have beat an entire matchup combined this week in the game we'll be discussing after this. Nothing's gone wrong here, let's be completely clear. But... Let's talk about what went right for Anchor. Because James has done nothing wrong. When your team scores 176 points, it's not worth breaking down much further. It's rough. Josh Allen, 31. Brees Hall, 29. Jameer Gibbs, 21. Cortland Sutton, 8 points. Josh Down, 16. Brock Bowers, 21. Austin Eckler, 13. And this is the real kicker that James was livid about. Boswell, 26 points. Despite Pittsburgh beating Baltimore 18-16, they didn't score a touchdown. They kicked six field goals, all of whom were Boswell, and three of which were 50-plus yards, which in our league gives out six points. We increase based on range, and you lose points based on misses. The closer the miss, the more points you lose. So him banging in three 50-plus yards is, I believe, 18 points off rip, and then 
three more field goals are kind of indeterminate ranges, just kind of boosted him up there. And then just to be the final final um, piece de la resistance, um, the Texans' defense with 28 points in their win over Dallas. Um, 10 points allowed, five sacks, interception, fumble, and a defensive score was the final nail in James's coffin. Ironically, and this is going to sound diabolical, James could have scored more points. He could have had an extra 11 points if he'd played Jared Goff against Jacksonville over Joe Burrow against the Chargers. And if he'd played Smith and Jigba instead of Brown, he could have had an extra 7 points, which is an extra 18 points, which is still not enough to win him the game. Let's be clear. Even if he played the perfect lineup, he would not have had enough points to beat this lineup. But it is insane that you could score 176 points and not have the most optimized lineup. I assume Anchor's in the same boat with not being able to optimize any further. Matterson 8.6 doesn't get in for anyone else. Yeah, I mean, she had, she had her best possible lineup. It's rough. Joe Mixon, Amara St. Brown, Joe Burrow played up a storm. In fact, they all won their direct head to heads. Joe Burrow outdid Josh Allen. Joe Mixon outdid Brees Hall. Emma Ross St. Brown outdid Josh Downs. Unfortunately, Jameer Gibbs outdoing Jones. Sutton beating out Brown. Bowles beating out Ertz. Eckler minimising Robinson makes it pretty even. And then you look at the kicker and defence and it's 16 point difference there. 20 point difference there. That's 36 points. You take them off. She's on 160. So before you get to kicker and defense, James is up by 16 points. While we joke about kicker and defense don't matter, they are game winners in this league especially. Um, and we've seen that aggressively today. <coughs> and then to round out the Andy Dalton fan club this week, we have a matchup that netted 154 total points and would have lost to James. James could have tag teamed these dudes and beaten them, but he couldn't beat Anchor. That's got to hurt. But let's see exactly what happened here. Carl Murray was on a buy. Neighbors was on a buy. No one else really did anything. Henry and McCaffrey are 27 points. A little bit scary. Nothing else really did anyone else. Once everyone's back from their buys and fit, Tom is going to ruin someone's season. I'm calling it now. Lamar Jackson, one of his worst games of the season. Uh, Fantasy-wise, 16 points. Montgomery, 25. Pollard, his worst game of the season, 5 points. Adams, 8 points. CD Lamb, 12 points. Kyle Pitts only managed a point. We'll talk about that more in a second. Dowdle managed 6 points. Bass managed 5. Eagles defense, 14. Going to be honest, Dad's pretty lucky that Kyler Murray and Malik Davis didn't play. If they'd have played, I can very easily believe he loses this game. Let's look at the bench. Oh, look at that. Taysom Hill, 45.25 points sat on the bench. Brock Purdy, 22 points on the bench. Brian Thomas, 9 points on the bench. That's upgrades in a number of positions. Unfortunately, my father's got himself in a position where he's got Kyle Pitts and Taysom Hill, both of whom can have big days, but you never know who's having what kind of day ahead of time. And it's just funny to see a 44-point swing sat on your bench. That's the difference between 93 and very beatable and 135 or whatever the fuck it is and untouchable. But that is it for the Andy Dalton fan club this week. Um, we're in a good spot. If we can get through bye week how next week, I think we have okay matchups for the rest of the season. So prayers up and good luck in your matchups. Let's head over to the Ghoulie 12 League. Right, and here we are in the Ghoulie 12 League. Unfortunately, we did not have enough this week as we fell five point shorts against Cam in a top of the table clash. After this loss, I've gone from first to fourth on the brink of playoffs. So let's see what happened. Um, Kind of a lot of nothing. Everyone did okay. No one had a pop-off week. Whereas for him, Puka Nakua went pretty hard. That is the difference maker there. Puka Nakua. You take, you take off basically anything from Puka Nakua. He doesn't beat me. Everyone did their job. 
29, 13, 10 from Bijan's lower than what he's done this season. Nico Collins on his first game back, 9 points. Bright, uh, Thomas, 13. Hunt Henry, 12. Quinton Johnson, 12. Will Lutz, 8. Like, everyone did their job. It just wasn't enough. It kind of sucks. I don't think I could have done any better. Tank, though, with 9.8 would have been a minor upgrade over Nico Collins, but it wouldn't have been enough to win me the game. It's just a rough one. Shit happens. I'm still confident this team could get me into the playoffs. They're all doing enough at their teams right now to give me a chance. My only concern is going to be getting through bye week because I'm without Robinson. I'm without a bunch of people next week. Uh, I'm without ETN. I'm without... I think I'm without the um, the Pittsburgh dudes as well. So I've got a big issue at running back next week. So... We're going to have to try and find a way through that without, without Joe Burrow as well. So definitely a bit of concern here. I'll be looking to see what I can do to um, get through that next week to make sure we can try and end the season strong. The regular season is one week longer in this league, so I have a bit more time, but still not ideal. Next up, Josh versus George. This is reminiscent of James and Anchor in the uh, Andy Dalton fan club. Very high scoring game and 140 points not being enough to win always hurts. And it was because of none other than Taysom Hill. A lot of people won't have started Taysom Hill because it's always difficult to know when he's going to go nuts. Looks like George chose the right week. Don't get me wrong, he has a really good team. Mix and 35, Jamar Chase 26, Josh Jacobs 23 is a great, great looking roster. But Taysom Hill coming in big dick swinging with 41 points is a game winner every single week. When you've got a roster like this, like CJ Stroud's had a poor week and Taysom Hill went, don't worry, I got you and then some. I, d I doubt there was a better... Um... So you could have played Derek Carr for an extra eight points if you wanted to really min max. Josh had nothing. Worthy would have been... A small upgrade over Robinson for an extra two points. Josh on paper can never ever win this game with these players, how they came out. It just so happens that he was on the losing side of it. I'm sure he will win games in the future where one of his players goes bazooka and just makes it impossible to win. But yeah, rough one for Josh there and George will be over the moon with his uh, two-game winning streak. Right. Wag is now on an eight-game losing streak. I want to be clear. We are going to rip the shit out of Wag. But it is all fun and games. Me and Wag have a lot of fun talking shit to each other in our group chat for the league. Um, but with that being said, he's so bad. He's lost eight. Brother, you are two and nine. How is that even possible? you got David Montgomery. Jerry Judy even turned up for you. What is this shit? What's on this bench? He's got a defense and a kicker sat on his bench. He's got Pacheco, who's going to be coming back from IR. He's got Wondell Robinson and Kyler Murray. He's got nothing. Kyle Pitts, Robinson, Pickens. He's, he's got no run game. He's got no pass game. He's got nothing. Look, there's nothing on his bench. Yeah, cool. Two buys and an injury. But what are we doing here? He's he's done the best with his lineup, but he's just not got enough talent. He passed up some trades earlier in the season that I think he should have taken in hindsight. And maybe he made some trades he shouldn't have made in hindsight. But my God, when you've got three guys scoring 20 plus points and someone not scoring an insane amount of points, you've got to find a way to win. And this don't win. Poor, poor, poor from Wag. I'm no longer laughing at Wag. I'm disappointed at Wag because he's better than this. However, Oscar um, did a pretty good job. Josh Allen, 24 points. Kamara, Brown, solid. C.D. Lamb, Zay Flowers, solid. Backup Chargers, tight end, I think. I don't even recognise that name. 18 points, huge. Aaron Jones, poor week, but still did better than his flex. Kickers, tied. Steelers defence lost out slightly to the Vikings, but it didn't matter. 
And he could have done better as well. He could have had an extra four points with Stafford. He could have had T. Higgins out there for an extra 18 points. Um, more. Extra 14 points. Could have had Pittman out there for a loss of points. And he would have won. Wag's got to do better. I want to see Wag win another game before the end of the season. Just so I can say, well done. You finished on a high. But I'm not convinced it's going to happen. He's really, really bad at the game. Next up. Luke versus Joss. I mean, it's a 50-point win. There's not going to be anything particularly special. I can't imagine. Yeah, he, he has that duo. Aaron Rohr and Brock Bowers. 69 points. Uh, 70 points. When your tight end and one of your wide receivers combine for 70 points, you're going to win more than you lose. Texans defense on top of that with 19 points. Jared Goff with 34. You've, you're on to a winning matchup. I mean... Wait a second. 70, 105, plus 125. He didn't need to play his kicker, flex, Debo Samuel, or either of his running backs, and he beats 120 points. When you've got a full man who does that, you're not going to lose basically any games. He managed to beat out someone who had Saquon Barkley this week. I wonder how many losing teams Saquon Barkley was on this week. And James Cook. He had 52 points from running backs, so and it's more than enough. Tillman underperformed, Myers underperformed, Hunt underperformed. Just no, no, no. 119 points would have beat 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It would have beat about half the league. So you can't be too harsh. But you do just have to ask yourself, what are you going to do? Kareem Hunt's usage is only going to go down as Pacheco comes back. Myers, Tillman, Moore is not a great lot of choice for wide receiver. And who knows what's going on with neighbours in the Giants after Daniel Jones is benching. So, Joss has probably got some things to be concerned about coming on to the back end of the season. Ian versus Mick. The... L two lowest scoring people this week. I want to make it completely clear. Ian would not have beat anyone else this week. He is a lucky, lucky man. And how did he manage to get so lucky? Smith and Jigba, 21 points. There you go. No, I mean, Boswell, oh my God. So, Mick has Boswell as his kicker, who scored 24 points even in this league. And that's a third of his points at nearest, damn it. Most of lost in points. Purcell added nothing. Kelsey basically did nothing. Nick Chubb had a poor week. Garrett Wilson had a poor week. Ravens' defence did okay. I mean, it, it neutralised the equivalent of Ian's. I just... No one turned up. Jane Daniels, 13 points. It was Jameer Gibbs and Chris Boswell versus the world. And they still somehow kept it close. And again, I don't know really how. Mooney didn't do a lot. Andrews didn't do a lot. Other than that, though, I don't need... You've got two guys who've broken 20 points and you've not even broke 100. Just a really, really, like, weird teams. 28 points he could have had at tight end, so that would have been an extra 24. And that's it. You could have an extra two at kick, so you could have had an extra 26 points, which would put him on 124. And this game was very winnable. If he'd have played and Joko instead of Kelsey, he wins. No, he doesn't quite win. So if he'd have played and Joku instead of Kelsey and Adams instead of Purcell, he would have won the game. And he also had Matteson, who would have been an upgrade over Nick Chubb, or Mostert, more so Mostert. All three of these guys should have started in hindsight. And with just two of them starting, he wins the game. That is rough. Um, but that... Oh, no, it's not it. I miscounted. We've got one last game. No DeVito, no wins. That name has not been changed based on the New York Giants changing their quarterback. It was just a omen of the apocalypse in... 
New York, and Josh seems to have paid dividends. He won this week against Tony, 128 plays 101. This is going to be pretty average, I expect. Nothing too weird. Riesel with 31 points, the difference maker. Other than that, it was basically tied. Cooper Cup, 28 points, pretty big. Nothing particularly noting about lack of performance. Obviously, Lamar Jackson and Derek Henry had pretty poor games in their loss to Pittsburgh, so that was a pretty big blow. Lamar's been averaging 20-plus points. Derek Henry's been averaging about 15, I would say. So you're losing about 15 points there, which makes this game a hell of a lot closer. Smith and Brand didn't do much. Sean Jennings had a really good game, which helped out a bunch. But other than that, everyone underperformed. Jackson, Henry, Dowd, Brown, Smith, likely all underperformed what I'd really expect from them at this point in the season. And Juwan Jennings couldn't cover the slack for all of them. And as a result, you end up losing. Whereas on the flip side, Hertz had an okay game. Williams, pretty poor. Brees Hall, really good. Cooper Cup, really good. McLaurin, pretty poor. Schultz, okay. Swift, really good. McPherson, not enough to overturn Bates. Yeah, it's just the big scores rack up. 18, 28, 31, kind of did all the damage. Was there enough for anyone to turn it around here? Jordan Love would have given him an extra 6 point. Vlad McConkey would have given him an extra 12. That would have been an extra 18. That wouldn't have got him close. So yeah, just, it just is what it is. It's a rough one for uh, Tony, but... He's got players that should bounce back. You might want to have a look at this Dowdle situation running back too. Um, but yeah, because his only other running back is Algier. So that's a little bit concerning, I'd imagine. Especially with Dallas having no real quarterback now. Their run game is going to be affected by that because a team can sell out to stop the run more knowing that Cooper Rush can't throw the ball worth a damn. That's it for Fantasy Football Roundup this week. Make sure you get liked, make sure you subscribe. Comment down below how it's going in your league. Are you running away with it? Are you the one seed? Are you on the playoff bubble? Are you out of playoff contention? Are you rebuilding for next year already? Thanks as always, and I'll see you next time.